Hola, it's great to be in uh, Miami at Florida International University. I uh, want to thank President Rosenberg. I want to thank everybody here today. We've got a great group of folks assembled here. I've got a, a legislative all-star team behind me here. Uh, we have Senators uh, Manny Diaz and Ray Rodriguez. Uh, is Ileana here? Yes. Senator Ileana Garcia, great. Uh, we have Ileana. Uh, we also have representatives in Golia, Alupis, Fernandez Barquin, Rizzo, Busada Cabrera, Fabricio Bush, Barrero, and Representative Danny Perez. So I want to thank them for all their hard work this session, not only on this bill that we'll sign today. I think we, you know, we set the standard my first year and somehow exceeded the second, and now we've even exceeded it this third year again. And so when you look at law and order, uh, when you look at uh, teacher bonuses, when you look at school choice, all these things we were able to do, uh, these guys uh, really drove the train on that. I'd also like to thank a few other folks who we were here from today. Uh, Darielle Fernandez, uh, Cuban American, where are you at? You're here, okay. Um, Alberto Paroch, Venezuelan American, is here. <laughs> Felix Rodriguez, um, Cuban American icon. Where's Felix? Okay, good. Thank you. Carlos Diaz Rocio, um, and also James O'Keefe from Project Veritas. <laughs> We're here today to uh, sign in the uh, law legislation that we work very hard on, uh, these legislators work very hard on, and really Florida uh, is the trailblazer yet again on another issue that's really important to not just millions of Floridians, but really tens of millions of Americans. When the founding fathers uh, established our country uh, and, and crafted the Constitution, they were very concerned with threats to liberty, primarily uh, emanating from government power. And, and they believe concentrations of power uh, inevitably would lead to people's liberties being curtailed. So they designed a constitution that had separation of powers, checks and balances, and it was designed to create a government that could do the things that you needed a government to do, but did it in a way that was as safe as possible and had as many different checks along the way and balances so that you didn't have an accumulation of power in one part of the government. Um, and I think that they were very smart about that. And obviously, uh, we've seen other societies that have not had those protections. Uh, the results have inevitably been disastrous. We are now, though, in a situation where we have things that I think were probably unforeseen by the Founding Fathers, um, whereas they established a First Amendment to protect people's freedom of speech, religion, and association from government overreach, uh, we now have a situation in which some of these massive, massive companies uh, in Silicon Valley are exerting a power over our population uh, that really has no precedent in American history. And I would suggest the monopolies today, these big tech monopolies, are exerting way more influence over our society than the monopolies of the early tw earliest 20th century, which led to antitrust and a lot of trust busting. And so we're in a situation here where these platforms have become our public square. Uh, Floridians and other Americans go on these platforms to be able to share ideas. Heck, um, you go back to the beginning of these platforms, they actually were very liberating because you had corporate media, those legacy outlets, that many Americans grew to distrust, and rightfully so, um, they no longer had the monopoly on information. You could actually go around the legacy media, share information on these platforms, uh, and that was very, very positive for millions and millions of Americans. And actually, it was a, a little too positive, and the powers that be didn't like that. And so I think what we've seen in recent years is a shift away from internet platforms, social media platforms, from really being liberating forces to now being enforcers of orthodoxy. And so their primary mission or one of their major missions seems to be suppressing ideas that are either inconvenient to the narrative or that which they uh, personally disagree with. And you think about some of the things that are in the news just most recently. The, of the last however many decades, 
you know, some of the major issues that we've had to deal with. I would say two of the major issues when people look back on this period will be the efficacy of coronavirus lockdowns and the origin of the coronavirus in Wuhan, China. Now we have information that this very well may have emanated from the Wuhan lab, that it was a, it was a leak from the lab. But you remember when people last year were raising that as something that needed to be investigated, they were deplatformed for talking about uh, the lab leak. They were censored for having said that. And now even Fauci admits that this may be something that very well um, is the case. Are they going to now censor Fauci and pull him down off social media? So this shows you um, because corporate media said it was a conspiracy theory at the outset, um, these big tech oligarchs responded to that, pulled down, instead of having an honest debate about something that's very, very important. Clearly, it's going to affect our relationship with China if this was something that leaked from a lab uh, and they immediately covered it up. We know they did cover up regardless, but certainly from that very beginning, it's a crucial, crucial thing for the American people to know big tech they wanted to, to shut down debate over that. You also go back to March, April of 2020, anyone posting criticisms of lockdowns, those things were taken down. They were censored. But now we stand here and look at Florida. You know, we're open and people flock here because they understand it's better to live in freedom. The places that locked down and followed those policies that were basically advocated by Silicon Valley, you know, they've had a lot of problems, high unemployment, high crime, higher per capita COVID mortality, the list goes on and on. So these are major, major issues. And I would say those lockdowns have ruined millions of people's lives all around this country. Wouldn't it have been good to have a full debate on that um, in our public square? But that was not what, what Silicon Valley wanted to do. So this is a big problem. And, and we, we don't even need to get into the election interference that we see from Silicon Valley on major issues uh, that deserve robust debate. Silicon Valley is, an, is acting as a council of censors. Um, they cancel people. When mobs come after somebody, they will pull them down. They shadow ban people, which creates partisan echo chambers. And honestly, they are some of the major reasons why this country is divided for, for doing what they're doing. And the worst part about this, Silicon Valley thinks they know better than you. So their power up to this point has effectively been unchecked. Um, and they have used this power in Silicon Valley to impose their orthodoxies and their ideologies um, on our public square. Um, this is not how a free society uh, should operate. Uh, they use secret algorithms and shadow banning to shape debates and control the flow of information, uh, but yet they evade accountability by claiming they're just neutral platforms, even as they amplify partisan agendas and censor dissent. So every day they act uh, as the proverbial big brother in 2021 looks an awful lot like the fictitious 1984. So it's time to step up and ensure that we, the people, especially our everyday Floridians, are guaranteed protection against the Silicon Valley power grab. With the reform we will sign in today, we'll be the first state to hold big tech accountable so that everyday people who use their platform have an ability to fight back. And the protection should not simply be uh, something that is reserved for celebrities or for political office holders. It needs to apply to everyday Floridians. And what this reform does is recognize that social media platforms are as important for conveying public opinions. Um, they're effectively a common carrier uh, in everyday society, and they really need to be viewed that way. Uh, they also hold a unique place in preserving free speech for all Floridians. Um, and these platforms can harm Floridians when they unfairly censor, ban, and deplatform them. So this reform gives every Floridian the power to fight back against big tech. Floridians who are deplatformed will be able to sue big tech companies for violating this law. And courts may award up to $100,000 in damages for each proven 
claim these protections aren't just for elite but for everyday people millions of people who rely on social media to keep up with the news do business and stay connected with family and friends we're the first state to hold these big tech companies to this standard of transparency and accountability the law requires the platforms to publish detailed standards explaining how they decide which voices to censor and they need to apply those standards consistently that's not what happens you look they have these standards they always change it and if you're on one side it seems to be any little foot foul you're gone but if you're on the right side from their perspective then you know you can get away with whatever you want and so when big tech censors enforce their rules inconsistently to discriminate in favor of the dominant ideology in silicon valley they will be held accountable in the state of florida and all floridians treated unfairly by big tech platforms will have the right um, to sue companies to violate uh, this law and win damages to reform safeguards the rights of every floridian by requiring social media companies to be transparent about their content moderation practices and give users proper notice of changes to those policies. I mean, there's some people that get the platform, they don't even know what they're getting the platform for. That prevents big tech bureaucrats from, quote, moving the goalpost to censor viewpoints they don't like. But it's not just individuals. The attorney general under this law of Florida can bring action against tech companies that violate this law under Florida's Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act. If social media platforms are found to have violated antitrust law, they will be restricted from contracting with any public entity. That antitrust violator blacklist imposes real consequences for big tech uh, and for their bottom line. The law also prohibits big tech from deplatforming political candidates for elected office in the state of Florida. The Florida Election Commission will post fines of $250,000 per day on social media companies that the platforms any candidate for statewide office uh, and additional penalties uh, lesser for local offices. Um, any Floridian can block any candidate they don't want to hear from, and that is a right to belong each citizen. Uh, you simply can avert your eyes or not subscribe to what they're doing, but it's not for big tech to be weighing in on these elections and picking the candidates that have the right to speak and those that should be silenced. They're not... <laughs> Now, if there's an old saying, um, I think it was Bill Buffy that said he would uh, rather be governed by the first 2,000 names in the Boston phone book than the Harvard faculty. Um, well, I would say if I had to pick one group of people to not be governed by, it would be the bureaucrats and oligarchs in Silicon Valley. They are not the arbiters of truth. Uh, they are not accountable uh, to the electorate. Um, and what we're doing now is informing, uh, is reform, empowering Floridians to hold these companies accountable and to give protections for people in terms of their daily lives. And if you think about some of the things that we have seen, when you had the, the parlor company get taken down, that was like one fell swoop from a bunch of different companies acting basically in concert. They took them off web hosting. They took their payment processing. They took all this stuff down. So just think about it. You run a small business and you have all these different things that, that impact how you do it. You advertise online, you have a payment processor, you have an email distribution list, all these things. And what, if someone in Silicon Valley doesn't like you, then they can work together and just wipe you off. Um, you know, that's people's livelihoods that are at stake. Those are people's businesses and ultimately people's jobs that are at stake. And so I think the implications are, are profound. Um, and I think the protections we are providing today um, against big tech censorship will make a difference. And not only that, we're already seeing other states are now starting to follow suit. And so it's not, it starts in Florida, uh, but it's not gonna end in Florida. And I think we're gonna have a huge movement behind us. So uh, I wanna thank the legislature. I wanna thank a lot of Floridians who, uh, who have spoken out in favor of making sure that individual Floridians are protected, uh, that we're protected against censorship, that people have the ability uh, to weigh in on these important issues and what has now become a digital public square. I'm gonna let some of the legislators come up, legislators who were involved in the bill. We'll also hear from some of our 
our uh, other speakers, um, and then we'll we'll move on, and, and, and I'll put the old John Han Hancock on the bill, and it will become the law uh, of this state. So first, uh, I want to bring up our Senate, uh, main Senate sponsor uh, from Southwest Florida, Senator Ray Rodriguez. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The governor shared that we're the first state to pass this legislation and hold big tech accountable. What he didn't share with you is we weren't the first state to introduce this legislation. This legislation has been introduced in multiple states and big tech has put their lobbyists to work and they've killed it in every other state but one. That state passed the bill that then went to the governor and big tech put the pressure on the governor and the governor vetoed the bill, but not in Florida. Not today. We have a governor that has shown the will to fight when the cause is freedom. And for that, Florida is blessed. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. And I'll just say there's two things to take away from this bill that I hope you leave with. The first is this. In Florida, if these big tech monopolies want to do business, then they're going to treat Floridians fairly. And the second is this. When it comes to freedom of speech in this state, we will defend freedom of speech against digital book burners, regardless of how big they are or how powerful they are. Because speech is fundamental to our freedom. Thank you. main house sponsor uh, from Hernando County on the other coast of Florida, Blaze Angolia. First, I want to thank uh, Governor DeSantis for his leadership on this, but not just this issue, multiple issues. You know, when you look at the things that we're doing in the state of Florida, Florida's leading, whether it comes on, whether it's taking on big tech, resiliency, uh, parental or school choice, uh, deregulating for businesses, and just protecting every day's, everyday Floridians' lives. Um, this legislature and this governor is leading where other governors are shying away from these big obstacles. So, Governor, thank you for everything that you do. For the Regarding the bill, I along with the legislators behind me and this great governor, do not think that a handful of uh, kids behind some desks in Silicon Valley get to be the arbiter of what free speech is. And make no mistake about it, this is a consumer protection bill. Our Floridians are being hurt by these big tech oligarchs. These companies are huge, huge monopolies, and it is about time that somebody took them on head on. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership on this issue. Okay. Next, we have Dario Fernandez. Hi, hello, everybody. First, I wanted to say thank you, God, for this opportunity. Thank you, God, because we have one of the best governors in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Today is a special day. It's an important day, not just for the state of Florida. It's an important day for the United States of America. I remember 20 years ago when I came from Cuba, I came from my country try to find liberty, freedom of speech. Today, the big tech wanted to have more power to the Supreme Court of the United States. And we cannot allow that happen here in this country. I think today, everybody in the United States see Florida as a new way to go. And this is important for all Americans. When you see a company that took your data, doing everything what they want, if you say, I believe in God, sometimes they say, they close your channel. When you say something that is really important for the community, they close your channel. And they don't want you to say, the reality, 
what is happening right now in the United States. That is why this is important, not just for Florida, for all the United States of America. We need government like Ron DeSantis that push this kind of law. We need elected officials that help the community. And the community has an important role in this because they are the one that can help to pass what I have right now. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right, thank you. Next, we have uh, Alberto Paroche. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is not important. I'm just a messenger, and the message is what it leads. And that's what I'd like you to go home with. I was born in Venezuela. Why is that important? Because I come from the future. I come to warn you about do not flirt with disaster. More than 20 years ago, forever, Venezuela was number one country in Latin America. Sorry if there is other people from Latin American countries, and I know there are. <laughs> Don't worry, it sounds kind of like, but believe me, a country where you eat a mango and throw the seed there, and three days later, there is a tree there. Believe me. If you have long fingers, put it in the ground, and there'll be a geyser of oil. You understand? We founded OPEC. We had PDVSA, who was one hell of a company. We had Citco, who was one hell of a gas station, now on pump a pen in there, you understand? And I came here thinking this is a free country. I always admire the uh, uh, United States. My son is American. And lately, a few years ago, I became one. I swore to defend this country. I'm not in my rounds. I'm VARA, Venezuelan American Republican Alliance. And in a way, and in a way, we are not only Venezuelans. We started with Venezuelans. We got Nicaraguans, Colombians, Mexicans. We got people from Guatemala. Okay, we got people really worried. Cubans really worry about, about what is going on. Okay, and please, big tech may have a lot of money. They can buy countries, entire countries. And sometimes I get my friends. I have friends who are Democrats. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but I, I'm fighting. Uh, we're having a barbecue. So come on, there are the people from big, 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 these big companies. They're Americans. No, they're not. You know what it established is the love that you have for this country, and it's what you do for this country, okay? And one of the last Democrats who had really common sense was John F. Kennedy. He says, ask what you can do for your country, know what your country can do with you, all right, for you. So right now is the moment of doing 2022 is coming up. I don't want to sound so electoral, but please, please put your battery on. I want to tell you Venezuela had beaches, climate. I, I mean, we, we were all, I come from an Italian family. Italy used to be a soccer uh, champion. We don't even qualify after 25 years of socialism. Okay? So, you know, we were among the G4. Right, right now we're maybe maybe 20th, and and Greek is Greece is passing us, so we're not even qualified for the World Cup. Okay, so that's one. Just to tell you, and I come from an Italian family. I'm the only one born in Venezuela, and I lived there as I was director of the young executive of Venezuela. What was it? Capitalist. Do your enterprise. Don't wait for the for the government to give you anything. Place. Write history yourself. All right, have generosity towards yourself. Be strong and help the other ones. Just don't be there asking for help. Don't victimize yourself. The government is kept to give you an environment of security. Thank God we have a government who's do the governor who's doing it. All right, big chested, and he's putting his chest into this, and that makes me happy today because it's been many days that I'm not that happy. All right? We mix in Venezuela, racist. I tell you some similarities, and this is important. This is important. They packed the courts. Chavez packed the courts. All right? Why? Because they changed the Constitution. Right? And the God given gift of speech, which he separates from animals that don't speak. All right? The Constitution is the it, 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 free speech, is the pillar of any society around the world, not only here. All right? And it's guaranteed by our Constitution defended because there is not one place in history, any country that has changed its constitution that has something or a nice story to tell. So it's placed on, as a First Amendment, not as a fourth, fifth, 
25th is placed as first because it's the most important, and I don't want to touch the subject, but then the second amendment is, is to make sure that the first one stays. And the second amendment, people, it is not to take a gun and go to Walmart and shoot people. The second amendment is making sure that the government doesn't come and knock at your house, take your kids, and tell your kids in school that the Che Guevara was a Freedom fighter. You understand you put your life saving half a million dollars into Harvard school. We have an alumni here, okay? And <laughs> at that time probably they didn't teach that. But listen, listen. And your son comes out with a t-shirt saying with a penny locker of Gucci and an iPhone of a thousand dollars. But you know, you don't know anything about history. Che Guevara was a freedom fighter. What? Do I burn the school? Who do I talk to? What is the dean of the school? What, what am I paying for to have this guy in my house? All right, so people, this is the moment we gotta think, please go out, the truth will free you, okay? And I've been, I'm known in my rounds as zero silence, I don't plan to stay quiet, I'm gonna make it short, sir, I know you're busy. <laughs> but, but do not stay quiet, whoever stays quiet because of fear is an accomplice to what is about to be here. You understand what I'm saying? Please, speak, this is the moment, back this man up. Florida, Texas, let's save this country. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, Felix, can you uh, come up here and top that for us? <laughs> Governor, it's a pleasure to be here today. To me, you are the best governor in the United States of America. Thank you. I came to this country when I was 13 years old in 1954. I came to school here, graduated in Perkiom and Prep in Pennsylvania in 1960. I was accepted at the University of Miami for engineering, but I decided I had to do something about what's going on in my home, homeland. So I joined the Bay of Pig Invasion. And then I continued to work with the CIA for many years in three different continents. What I'm seeing today is very worrisome to all of us. We lost our country one time. I don't want to lose my country the second time. It is impossible to be able to maintain a democracy when you have people that are going to veto your voice, like these high-tech people in the media. Fortunately, for the first time, in a long time, we have a governor that is putting a stop to that. And it is very important to do that because they have, like, they could do anything they want and they are vetoing our right to speak. And they have the same type of technology that the National Security Agency have when a few words pop up in their computers, they go and see who you are talking about that they don't like and they showed you up and they should not do that. So we have proof 100% we are very proud to be here and support uh, Governor DeSantis. One thing I want to tell you before I leave. In 19, the 2022 elections probably is going to be the most important election in the life of the United States of America. If we don't win back the Senate and the House, we are going to lose the United States of America as we know it today. There's no question about it in my mind. And you know what? May 31st, I'll be 80 years old. I have no place to go. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you, Felix. Carlos, are you here? Where are you at? Thank you, Mr. Governor. How do you top that? Wow. Uh, if you would allow me, let me do three things. Number one, give you uh, a few thank yous. Uh, number two, tell you about this new center, the Adam Smith Center. And number three, give you some personal observations about this historic bill. So first, thank you, Mr. Governor. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your support of the center. And thank you for implementing policies that are the envy of the nation. So thank you. Thank you to the Lieutenant Governor for your leadership and to the senators and representatives here. And let me single out two of them who were truly instrumental in getting this center off the ground. Senators Rodriguez and Diaz right behind me, thank you for all the support. And one more thank you. Thank you to the leadership of FIU, the president, the provost, the vice presidents, 
um, for welcoming the center with such open arms and for welcoming me personally uh, with such warmth and enthusiasm. Because we are FIU's newest center, let me tell you just a word about who we are and who we aspire to be. Working at the intersection of government policy and the free market, the Adam Smith Center for Economic Freedom hopes to become a world-class, independent, nonpartisan think tank right here in the heart of Miami to inform, to influence, and to inspire current and future leaders to develop and implement innovative, uh, meaningful, and effective public policies to advance individual freedom and human prosperity. Established by our own legislature and governor less than a year ago, the center will harness the power of research to offer a better understanding of our capitalist system and its impact on economic growth, both at home and abroad. Through our activities and programs, we hope to inspire policy discussions, analysis, and decision-making. We are steadfast in our commitment to objectivity and nonpartisanship, which means that we will promote ideas and discussions that are relevant to both sides of the political aisle with meaningful and honest representation from both Republicans and Democrats, from both academics and practitioners. As a university, we strongly believe in the principles of free expression and the respectful exchange of different ideas and viewpoints, even when those ideas and viewpoints are difficult to hear. But even though we're steadfast in that commitment to political impartiality and freedom of expression, we're unabashedly supportive of democracy and the free enterprise system as the most effective ways to promote individual freedom and human prosperity. I know very well that these systems are not perfect. As Winston Churchill once said, when speaking about democracy, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the other forms that have been tried from time to time. And when speaking of capitalism, he said, the inherent vice of capitalism is the unequal sharing of blessings. The inherent virtue of socialism is the equal sharing of miseries. We know that there's other political systems, political and economic systems out there that have proven time and again to oppress people and to lead to economic misery the world over, including right here in our hemisphere. But while the proponents of those ideologies thrive on censorship and canceling other people when their opinions are different from their own, we, on the other hand, look forward to engaging in a serious and civil debate with them. We, as a center, we will be laser focused on empirically and rigorously studying different varieties of capitalism and promoting a more responsible and thoughtful free enterprise system in Florida, in the United States, and around the world. That is why we feel it's so important for organizations to be committed to the principles of fairness and impartiality, especially when they're responsible for hosting and disseminating different forms of expression. And that is why it becomes necessary, at times, for there to be meaningful laws that regulate the behavior of actors that break uh, with those important principles. And as we know, that is exactly what has been happening with big tech. Listen, I believe that in general, less regulation is always better than more regulation. Right. Period. Period. Yeah. But when big, powerful players that act in effect as monopolies are not following the rules of the game, we need referees to bring order to the game. And in my opinion, my humble opinion, that is exactly what this bill does. It levels the playing field for all Floridians so that they can be treated fairly. And it brings transparency and accountability to the process. So that if a social media organization wants to remove somebody, someone from their platform, the process can be transparent. Social media organizations are simply being asked to publish a set of standards, objective standards, which by the way, they get to set themselves for determining how to de-platform users and of course, apply those standards without prejudice. The message here, in my opinion, is a clear one. Big tech, like any other business, needs to follow the rules in an unbiased manner. It's that simple. And that is why this big is so important and that is why it's so historic. We might not realize it now, but who know, you know who probably does realize it? People in countries like Cuba, like Venezuela, like Iran, North Korea, like China, uh, because people in those countries know very well what it's like to be censored by big, powerful players who cannot tolerate dissenting opinions. So thank you, Mr. Governor. Thank you for standing up against those who may want to censor Floridians. Thank you for standing up against potentially unfair and arbitrary censorship and for promoting free speech throughout our great state. Listen, people can agree or disagree on the substance or even the details of a bill. 
That is normal. In fact, that is healthy. But we should always stand up together to protect freedom of expression. And we need to be concerned about censorship of any type. Mr. Governor, as you know so well, taking on a player as big and as powerful as big tech is not easy. It takes courage. Therefore, we know that there's always going to be controversy around it. And that is why we would like to serve here at the center as a neutral place where people with different perspectives can come in and debate the merits and the liabilities of this bill or any bill, present their opinions, defend them with evidence, with data, with solid arguments, and yes, with passion. And that is how we can make progress, not by supporting or opposing something for the sake of it, but by going through the arguments and defending them rigorously and transparently. So Mr. Governor, we would like to offer that platform to you and to anyone who wants to engage in a serious debate about the issue so we can collectively promote individual freedom and advance human prosperity in a society where different people can work together for the common good, even when, or I should say especially when, they disagree with one another. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, it's great to be here at my alma mater. Always proud to be here. Uh, I wanna thank everyone that's here behind me, all of our legislative leaders that work so hard along with our governor. And the reason that Florida is leading today and not just today is because we have a great governor in Ron DeSantis. <laughs> He has demonstrated such courage on taking on big tech because I think everyone here in this room understands how difficult it is. And you heard that when Senator Rodriguez mentioned how we have not seen one other state lead like our state has under this governor. So I'm proud to be a part of this administration. And we heard from our past, an icon like Felix, who not only has been so important for our community, our state and our country and what he has done for this country. And I thank you, Felix. We also heard from the future, my good friends over there, my Venezuelan friends. And I think the words that he shared, the warnings that he shared should really shake us to our core. But today we're going to hear from the president when our governor signs this bill and puts us on a path to protecting everyday Floridians and making sure that we will not be censored, we will not be silenced. And the ugliness that we've seen in so many of our community that have fled communism, tyranny, and oppression, that those ugly demons won't rear their head here in Florida. And thank you again for being here, and thank you, Governor DeSantis, for taking this issue on. Well, thanks, everybody. I think it was great remarks across the board. And at the end of the day, today what we're doing, we are protecting Floridians' ability to speak and express their opinions. This will lead to more speech not less speech, because speech that's inconvenient to the narrative will be protected, uh, where it doesn't have those protections uh, going on now. And, you know, we think when I heard Felix come up, you know, we tend to think of threats to liberty in, in, the, in the guise of a, of a bearded tyrant with military fatigues. And, and as we know, that, that is absolutely the case. And we see the legacy uh, of that uh, uh, tyranny in places like Cuba and Venezuela. Uh, but we also have to understand when there's uh, great power lodged in other institutions uh, that that has an impact and could potentially abridge people's freedoms. And so uh, today, maybe this isn't as much the bearded tired in the military fatigues. You know, maybe the person is um, on, in pajamas on their laptop drinking a soy latte in Silicon Valley. <laughs> you know what? When they have the power to be able to silence you, you take it seriously. And so that's what we're doing here today. I think we will have more robust debate in the state of Florida uh, as a result uh, of the legislation that we're signing today. And I can tell you this, if you believe in the power of, of your own ideas, you should welcome robust debate. You should want there to be people that you can show why what you stand for is correct. When they try to silence Silence criticism of lockdown. Silence uh, people raising questions about the origin of the virus. Silencing uh, stories that are inconvenient for their preferred candidates. Uh, when they do that, you know, that shows you that they don't have confidence that their side would ultimately prevail because ultimately the truth will set you free. And so that's what we're doing here in the state of Florida, protecting everyday Floridians and ensuring that we have more speech, not less speech. And with that, we'll make it official.
front. Hey, guys, you guys in front. Hey, uh, Please. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait. You guys, I got to prepare a little bit here. Can you guys lower your phones down some, please? Guys, put the phones down, please. Now, I do think, uh, so today is the 23rd or 4th? 24th. 24th. Okay, then done. I think uh, obviously it's, a, it's I think it's a monumental day. It took a lot of work in the legislature. Uh, I know that um, you know we're really leading the way on this. We're proud of that. Uh, but it's also good time to reflect on a lot of the achievements that we were able to um, come up with in this last legislative session. You go back a year, everyone was predicting catastrophe for Florida's budget and economy. And in fact, um, we have robust reserve budget reserves uh, in, in our state budget, actually more than probably even before COVID started. Uh, if you look what we were able to do, uh, meeting our key priorities, not only did we continue with my momentum on Everglades and, and water resources, um, we actually did more than what we even forecast uh, because uh, of the underlying strength of Florida's economy. We were able to support our K through 12 system. We did thousand uh, dollar bonuses for all principals and teachers, which will be uh, rolling out in the, in the next couple of days. Uh, we also were able to double down on my, uh, one of the things we did last year, which kind of got lost in the pandemic. You know, we took last year, the average minimum salary for school teachers in Florida, we were in the bottom half of states. We brought us to the top five in average minimum salary. We did that again and actually added more to improve again going forward. Of course, I was in Miami a couple of weeks ago signing the biggest school choice expansion, uh, certainly in the country this year and, and maybe um, in decades. Uh, we also signed the strongest anti-rioting pro-law enforcement legislation anywhere in the country. We are not going to let any local government defund law enforcement. We will hold you accountable if you're violent. And we're going to let everyone that wears that uniform to protect and serve us that we stand with you. And not only are we not defunding the police, we're funding them and then some. We secured $1,000 bonuses for all first responders and law enforcement in the state of Florida. We signed a strong, um, transparent election uh, integrity package, which bans ballot harvesting in the state of Florida and bans Zuckerbuck. So we're here talking about big tech. They poured hundreds of millions of dollars into these groups that effectively ran elections in certain parts of the country. That's unacceptable. And with my signature on that bill a couple weeks ago, that is illegal in the state of Florida. Uh, we're not going to let special interests run our elections. Um, and we've got a lot more stuff that, that's coming down the pike. So uh, all I can say is, um, you know, we believe that we have probably unprecedented momentum in terms of uh, what's gone on with the economy in Florida. I mean, people uh, have the ability, a right to work, right to operate businesses. They're expanding. In fact, they, they, could, they need more employees. I mean, that's really the main thing at this point. People's home values um, are going up. So, so we're proud of, of what we've been able to accomplish. Um, 
you know, we are effectively America's West Berlin over the last year. And uh, people have viewed this as, as, a, as a free zone where not only they, they move to to follow their dreams, but even if it's just uh, visiting uh, for a time to escape some of the more repressive policies, and that even includes people that impose repressive policies, will still come down to Florida and actually have a little thing. So it's all good. Javier. A uh, question, Governor. Um, you've been pretty critical of critical race theory. Can you give us an update on what you're doing with some of these local uh, school boards, including Broward, which now is pushing Nation of Islam, Malcolm X? So the issue with um, uh, critical race theory, uh, one, we're going to be bringing that in front of the uh, State Board of Education. We're not putting any tax dollars uh, to allow uh, critical race theory. And understand, there's a movement now in some of the elite corporate outlets to gaslight people about what critical race theory is. I saw one thing saying, Texas has a bill. They don't want uh, people to learn about slavery. So that's nonsense. You teach the facts. You teach everything that's happened. But what critical race theory is, is basically race essentialism. It teaches people to view that as the most important characteristic. And obviously, if you're certain races, Caucasian, whatnot, they view that in a negative fashion. That is not something that's appropriate for schools. It's based on historical falsehoods. For example, some of these folks have tried to say the American Revolution was fought um, because they wanted to preserve slavery. Really, in Lexington and Concord? Is that what they were fighting about? I mean, just open up a history book, read the pamphlets, read what they were doing at the time. And so, um, so yeah, it doesn't have a place. The Board of Education is going to act, I think, and I think it's coming up in like a week or two. Uh, but ultimately, look, it's going to be up to the legislature and, and me if you continue to have uh, some of this um, some of this movement in spite of the state policy. I mean, it really should have funding um, consequences uh, th that flow from it. Look, have we done so well on the basics that we go off into these political and ideological tangents in our schools? They're not supposed to be indoctrinating kids with faddish ideologies. They're supposed to be teaching the basics and let them make sense of this for themselves. Um, if you could please comment on today's announcement by the Florida Department of Eco um, Economic Opportunity that you're stopping, we're stopping the additional federal pandemic assistance, the additional $20 sure. a week, please. Yeah, so the um, DEO uh, put out the notice that, so we reinstituted the job search requirements and now discontinuing the added uh, federal uh, money. And the re re reason is simple. We got almost a half a million job openings in the state of Florida. And so, you know, a year ago, I mean, I remember when, like, I got news Disney was going to close. Like, no one thought that was even possible. You started to see uh, tourism dry up and all these different things. There were people that, that had no ability. So we suspended a lot of the job search and all that stuff. We tried to get money out the door, particularly the federal money that we were able to get, um, and that was appropriate. Now we're just in a much different situation. Uh, no matter where I go in the state of Florida, people will tell me, Hey, we love Florida's great. Thanks for what you're doing, Governor. We just need to find more people yes. uh, to want to work. So the jobs are there. Uh, we're proud of the fact that we've got a lot of economic momentum. And so now we're transitioning from kind of, um, you know, relief in the midst of a crisis to now having the more traditional reemployment outlook, you know, that this is something that's a stopgap for people until they can get back on their feet and get back to work. But I'm confident with almost a half a million job openings uh, that people are going to be able uh, to, to, to get a job and get back to work. And, um, you know, most Floridians, to their credit, um, you know, have worked really hard throughout the entire course of the year. Uh, there are folks, and I actually meet some of them, who even though some of the benefits are pretty significant. They just decided, you know what, I love my job, you know, I want to be doing it or whatever. But I think this aligns the incentives better. And I think it'll really help, um, particularly a lot of our mom and pops. You know, we have restaurants that are thriving. Most places, the restaurant industry got totally decimated here. It's doing much better. But they'll have to close for a day or two just because they don't have enough staff to be able to do it. Yes, ma'am. Governor, hi. Uh, I want to ask you about the bill that you're signing here today. Um, uh, you're a loyal supporter of former President Donald Trump. Uh, for, uh, Donald Trump is now a resident in Florida, and he was deplatformed. Is this bill for him? 
The bill is for everyday Floridians, this is what we said, um, and it would allow any Floridian to be able to, um, to provide uh, what, what they're doing. So, um, but I think, I mean, I do think that's another issue that, that has been brought to bear. When you deplatform the President of the United States, but you let Ayatollah Khomeini talk about killing Jews, that is wrong. Thank you guys. God bless everybody.